Thank you for the warm welcome. It's amazing to be here. In an age where everything is available online, information is at your fingertips, what still remains authentic to each and every one of us is our own personal story. That's why I would like to take you on a bit of a time travel with me. So, it's somewhere in the 2000s, I'm in the final year of my computer engineering degree, and with around, along two peers of mine, we are doing this um, big data project with one of the biggest R&D labs back in India. And we're working for a bank, and the challenges of the bank are they need to make sense of their data. And how does the data look? Well, it's on the screen. It's my name written in different Indian languages, but also with data correction problems, as you can see. So what do we do? We come up with an uh, automatic language identification model based on n-gram support and used Unicode support in order to solve this issue. So big jargon terms, but basically it meant that it was my first touch point with the topic of natural language processing, which is where you use AI to teach machines how to write and speak like humans. A few Years later, I am working in these very cold but very cool data centers of HP where I'm programming, configuring, and testing the next generation of storage area networks. What are storage area networks? Well, they are the Kodak analog equivalent of the AWS and the clouds of today. Before that existed, we used to do this by hand in these cold data centers. And there is where I had my first touch point with the topic of AI ops which is predictive analytics, anomaly detection, using AI to manage storage systems. And then, in the early 2010s, as a strategy consultant here in the German automotive industry, I realized that the entire automotive ecosystem is going through a massive change. We're looking at a car as not just an ownership piece anymore, we're looking at it as a commodity, as a co computer on wheels. And this computer on wheels is being enabled with LiDAR, radar, sensors of all kinds, where deep learning and artificial neural networks are helping this particular commodity on wheels now to make sense of its environment. As a strategy consultant in this space, we are helping also clients roll out data intelligence platforms with next best action, next best offer uh, pro uh, solutions. And then, of course, we are also selling this overall vision to everybody, where we are saying, hey, you're going to be driving around, and actually not you, an autonomous electric vehicle will be in your name driving around while you're at work. Then it will charge its battery at your workplace. Then when you go home, you're going to start your mixer grinder with the same battery. And guess what? You'll also sell the extra energy you make with this battery charging over the blockchain. And all of us will become millionaires. It's 2023, and I'm still waiting on that autonomous self-driving car, and I'm, so are you. <laughs> but this was a very first example where AI was being perceived as something very disruptive. And then the pandemic struck, and I came back to my home turf, which is technology. Along with my seven-month-old son, I traveled around the world. I went to Miami, Toronto, Lisbon, Portu uh, Barcelona. Also, also Germany, at global hackathons, building with the Web3 community, because I wanted to understand what is it and how is this community ticking. And what did I learn? Even here, AI is already at, in play. You have risk modeling being done through predictive analytics model based on AI. So why is Jasmine telling you all these things? Why am I telling you all these things? As my other panelists and speakers have said before, suddenly the hot new thing, artificial intelligence, has actually been around for more than you know, a lifetime for many of us. At least it has been there uh, as part of most of my professional journey. And it started as uh, before by Alan Turing when he came up in 1940s with the Turing test. So what has changed? Well, in November last year, ChatGPT came out and the world went crazy. And why is that so? Because our perception of AI has gone from it being a sustaining innovation, which just results in incremental and iterative improvements in existing models, to now something that is going to change the landscape of everything that we know, employment, creativity, and the like. There's another interesting thing I want you to think about. So back when we were talking about Internet of Things, Factory 4.0, and I don't know what, we were always assuming that AI is going to replace factory workers and not us sitting here in this audience. And this is where the world went crazy. Because we, for the first time, realized that knowledge workers, in fact, are dispensable. 
So even if it is disruptive, what's the big deal, Jasmine? Let them be. Yes, if they are disruptive indeed, we have to look at what is the status of the current incumbents in this space. If you look at the studies done by Stanford, you will see, based on the current EU AI Data Act, only a very few of them, if at all, manage to abide by the criteria set. Interestingly enough, the best performer is Bloom, which is from Hugging Face, which is an open source model. Tells you something about the open source movement, doesn't it? So, in the meantime, while the internet had enabled zero marginal costs for content access and sharing, AI has enabled zero marginal costs, which in layman terms means the cost of adding an additional user to the ecosystem to, for abundant cre content creation. So we can see Charles and Camilla dancing at their coronation and Merkel and <laughs> Obama warming up in the beach. But all this is funny up until it is not. because clearly the new AI wave has a trust problem. So great, if even if there's a trust problem, we have solutions at hand. What is the first solution? We can eliminate stuff. What are, going, what are you going to eliminate with this abundant, uh, abundance of content creation, the entire internet? Well, Dumbledore has an answer. He says, we can authenticate, and guess where the best authentication technologies exist right now? Web3. Yeah, Web3 is one of the most misunderstood concepts out there. Um, there are many explanations that you find online. I personally find this one one of the best and easy to understand. While Web 1 and Web 2 democratize information and publishing, Web 3 democratizes ownership. It typically means that if you are using a Web 3 platform and providing data there, interacting with it through blockchain-based tokens, you can own a part of that model, a part of that platform. Anybody who creates on YouTube today, anybody who sells something on Amazon today, is under the danger that if Amazon tomorrow wants to duplicate your data and sell it at a price cheaper than you, you are out of the market before you know. So Web3 is a cultural movement. It's not just tokens and funny monkey pictures. It's much more than that. Another aspect of it is that by lowering the crucial costs that Web3 technology does for topics like verification, interoperability, composability. It creates a massive, massive space for digital creation with provenance. Provenance is just a fancy term which finds out the legacy of any digital article created out there. Who owns it? Who created it? And there, I'm sorry, Mr. Bullet, where Google's don't be evil then simply becomes can't be evil. But what excites me massively, personally, is that for the very first time, people below and above the equator have a chance of being at the table and being the decision makers for the technology movement of tomorrow. It's not, no longer about one Silicon Valley in one household, it's about Silicon Valley in every home, in, in every continent of the world. If there is the ETH Bogota or ETH India, you are seeing these self-taught developers, ecosystem managers, are coming to terms, Tobias mentioned 26,000 developers worldwide, all self-taught, no Stanford, Harvard offers degrees right now, just to give you a perspective. But all said and done, Web3 has a why problem. At its core, it's not about the speculative uh, Bitcoins and Ethereum prices. It, at its very core, Web3 is about purpose-driven economies. A bunch of people who come together as a community, agree on value add, and then create value in that ecosystem. And that's where it is fully, uh, it, it, you know, to a certain extent, as we say in German, a little wackelig. Because the central piece of that why is missing. But guess what? With AI, maybe Web3 gets its why, and AI has a trust problem. So great, it's a match made in digital heaven. But Web3 is still very much in its infancy stage. We are talking about Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper coming out in 2008, but actually, really, if you see it, the ecosystem started developing in 2020. And anybody who tells you otherwise, don't listen to them. <laughs> so we are truly in the stone age of the digital age. But what's the problem, Jasmine? Let Googles at the Microsofts of the world take care of AI. Why do you have to bother? Well, I do bother because one, three of the largest conglomerates on, in the world own web, one third of all online traffic, and half of all NASDAQ 100's total market cap. And if we are living in a world where data is really, truly our you know, most important capital, and we are living on it, 
Web3 can there really play a valuable role to ensure fair, fair compensation distribution of power. Look at the figures on the screen. Look at the amount of money one has to give to these huge centralized agencies in order to use their platforms. But then again, I always feel that if ha you have to get two trends to communicate with each other, you have to think on first principles level. And I have good news there as well, because AI and Web3 are very similar in their core ethos. I don't know how many of you know, but AI and its origins of LLMs, large language models, were popularly known as Muppetware, or where each and every model was labeled after a popular Muppet character. That's why Ernie, that's why Bert, etc., etc. They were building on top of each other. The Attention is All You Need 2017 paper from Google. If you've not already read it, please read it. It is the game changer, which OpenAI, which back then was open source, technology utilized in order to train their transformer model, and now it's closed source. So, AI and Web3 is a match made in digital heaven. It comes with its perils, though. Countering fake news can be enabled through the zero-knowledge proofs that can snarks technology with decentralized identity being stored on the blockchain. You can train models. Company like uh, Fetch AI are already designing compensating model, compensatory models uh, around that. Check out the company called Singularity Net. It is going to be the Facebook, which is not the right word for it, but of the decentralized Web3 space. But what is not good, and Tobias spoke about AI agents, what I'm a bit scared about is that we have created with Web3 this massive decentralized infrastructure where if an autonomous AI agent wants to open a wallet tomorrow, it can do so. That's why the Web3 community also needs to set up payment and guardrails to keep such factors in check. Experts in the machine learning space will tell you, decentralized compute doesn't work. That's why we are looking at centralized AI training models. But with federated machine learning, companies like Jensen and also Monitor API, Monster API are coming up with new solutions where your computer, screen, uh, computer laptops, your mobile phones can be utilized in order to uh, train future machine learning models. So what does the future hold for the players? So my hypothesis is that OpenAI will either end up being a sustaining innovation within the Microsoft Mammoth ecosystem, because it's a bit limiting, or it will finally become the platform on which every AI product of the world gets developed. Amazon and Facebook, I think, will end up supporting the open source ecosystem because it's not really in competition with their main values, uh, value offering. That's why they will try to disrupt it through that way. Google has to really th think about what it does about its search business, because if a chatbot is spitting out one correct answer and not giving you an opportunity to click on options, their business model will be challenged. And then, of course, Web3 uh, communities, uh, ecosystems will be going through a bull run. I'll just hurry up a little, because I'm a little low on time. But what does the future hold for us? For all of us in the room, don't believe anything. <laughs> Always consider everything is fake until proven otherwise. That's unfortunately the world we are in right now. What I'm particularly also interested in visual AI, where the, the topic will be do as I can, not as I say. We are visual creatures. We want the report to be developed in front of our eyes and not just some text being spit out all the time. And one thing I want to mention, everybody thinking about losing their jobs and be thinking that we're going to get a lot of free time to do massively amazing stuff. Also think about all those data laborers. They are basically called annotators. They live in countries like Nigeria, southern India, um, parts of Asia. What are they doing? They're doing underpaid work to label data. And that is something that we have to keep an eye on. So. In the end, I would leave you with this one last picture from Hans Morek, who very beautifully um, represented the illustration of the rising tide of AI capacity. Funnily enough, art, science, and cinematography was on the top of the peaks. Uh, not anymore. The tide is rising, and we are going to need a bigger boat. And if we are building this boat, let's come up with a rowing gear and sails maybe from Web3. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my time. I'm Jason. Please connect with me on LinkedIn, and I look forward to taking the dialogue forward.